people miss when they're reading these scriptures. But the book of Philippians is written to Paul's partners. Now that's a little bit subtle, but it's here. Look at this in Philippians chapter one and in verse three, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Dwayne can verify this. Anybody who travels can verify this, that when you minister a lot, there's some people that every time you think of them, you don't praise God every time you think of them. <laughs> the only way you praise God is to say, thank you, Jesus. I made it out of there alive, praise God. And I don't have to go back. For Paul to thank these people, these people were special to him. And he says, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, and it literally means partnership. And you can see this over in the fourth chapter. I'm going to come back to chapter one, but look in the fourth chapter. You can see that he's writing to his partners because in the fourth chapter, he says um, in verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. So Paul is saying, you Philippians are the only people that gave and supported me after I left the area. And you didn't do it just once, twice when I was in Thessalonica, you sent money to help him. So these people were partners. And uh, uh, again, it's obvious when you give to a church or to a ministry, how it helps them. But most people don't know how it helps you. But partnership is one of the keys to your prosperity. You know, there is a difference between giving occasionally, giving in response to somebody gave you materials. And so you're giving something back to cover the expense. And that's good. And man, I appreciate that. I'm sure Dwayne does the people that give, but when you partner with a ministry, it means that you are giving on a deliberate, uh, on purpose method of doing it. Did you know our bills come in on a monthly basis? And it's the people who give on a monthly basis that allow us to plan and to do things that we do. We have 42,000 partners that give on a monthly basis, and that supplies about 30% of our income. And without that 30%, man, our income would be up and down like a yo-yo. We need partners. Everybody needs partners. And Paul was writing to his partners. And right after he said this in Philippians chapter one, verse five, about he thanked God for their fellowship, their partnership in the gospel. The next verse says, being confident of this very thing that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We often lift that verse out of context and just apply this to anybody. I'm confident God's gonna complete that good work. Well, it is true that God wants to bless every one of us, but I'm not confident that every person is going to see God's good work performed in them. You know why? Because you have to cooperate. That's what Dwayne and I have been preaching all weekend long about how we have to take our authority. We have to seek, see, stand, or see, uh, let me get this, seek, see, speak, and stand. And so we have things to do to cooperate. And so even though, yes, God wants to bless everybody, not everybody gets blessed. You know why? Because not everybody cooperates. But when you partner, when you become a part and you pray for that ministry and you give and you help do it, did you know then you can say, I'm confident that the good thing that God began in you, he will perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus. And the same thing applies over here in chapter four, verse 19, when he says, but my God, shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Did you know it's God's will to bless every one of us, but not every one of us receives it because not everyone cooperates. But when you start partnering, when you give on a deliberate basis, it starts a supernatural flow towards you. You enter into partnership with that ministry. And I tell you, it releases blessing on your life. So as we receive the offering today, I just want to encourage you to give deliberately. You know, if you throw your seed 
you're going to lose a lot of it. Birds will eat it up. Some of it will fall on bad places. But if you dig a furrow and plant it and space it, you'll get a bigger harvest. That's right. And so I encourage you today to start giving on a regular basis. Well, our ushers have envelopes that they'll be passing down the aisles. This is for cash giving. And uh, we encourage you to uh, just be a blessing today. You know, it takes over $5 million a month for me just to pay my bills. I have about a million and a half dollars a month in television time. Then we have radio air time. We have uh, staff. We have the Bible school. We have, I think it's 70 uh, Bible schools around the world. Thousands of people that we're reaching. We're on television anywhere on the planet. You can go anywhere in the world and watch our television program. And it just takes a lot of money to get this done. But it's really a big bang for your buck. It really is. You stop and think, I have 4.4 billion people that can watch my program on a daily basis for, for less than one and a half million dollars. That turns out to be really cheap. It really is if you stop and look at it that way. And so we encourage you to give and God will bless you back. Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us and for giving us your son. You so love the world that you gave. And Father, we so love you and love people that haven't heard about you that we are giving today. And I pray specifically that you touch people's hearts about becoming partners, not only with us, but with Dwayne, with their church, with just make a commitment to start using the blessing that we have to put out the gospel and to touch other people's lives. Father, I pray that you would touch people and that they would find the joy of partnership. And so we agree. We receive this and thank you and believe you bless every person who gives back supernaturally in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. Hallelujah. You know, we've got a lot of things coming up uh, while they're receiving this offering. Let me just mention quickly, I've got uh, JB, uh, James Brown, and Tony B Dungy coming for our men's advance. And let's see, do I have the dates on that? Yeah. Oh. Let me see if I got the dates for this. Uh, that's March the 14th through the 16th. You know, uh, JB is the one that hosted the Super Bowl. If you saw the Super Bowl, you saw JB. And JB and his wife, Dorothy, are great friends. And I tell you, they are powerful believers and they are making a huge impact. And so JB and Tony Dungy will be with us for the men's advance. There may be some of you that you know some people that would never come just to hear a preacher, but man, to come and hear these people, Tony Dungy is uh, in the um, NFL Hall of Fame or, or is it Sports Hall of Fame or... Anyway, he's, he's a big deal in, uh, in that realm. He had a son that committed suicide and he speaks about this and he's going to be in our Woodland Park School District speaking to all of the students about suicide. That's going to be awesome. We have an Army conference coming up March the 26th through the 28th and I'm going to have General uh, Jerry Boykin. If you've ever heard that man, he is awesome. Man, you want to stand up and salute when you listen to this guy. And we're also going to have Congressman Bob McEwen, which Bob McEwen has the best thing on the internet that I have ever heard in my life about the difference between capitalism and socialism. If you haven't heard that, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it is excellent. Really, really good. We've got campus days coming up April the 3rd through the 5th. This is where you can come and sit in on our Karis Bible College and sample it. And then we have the David, David the musical coming up uh, April the 12th through the 13th. And it's going to really be good. If you haven't been out to our uh, Colorado campus, I'd encourage you to please make the effort to come. It's a modern day miracle. It really is. It's, it's uh, miraculous what God has done. And uh, thanks to all of our partners who've made all of this happen. How many of you are partners with us? Can I see your hand? Wow, what a blessing. Thank you so much. And you know, every good thing that happens through this ministry gets put on your account. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 1. 
Luke chapter one. And real quickly, let me just say, I know that I talked to a couple of people that have, this is your first service. Uh, Dwayne and I've been talking about real similar things, but my portion of it, I've been talking about, you've got to understand the authority that we have as a believer. And I used uh, a number of examples where like Peter and John just told the man, such as I have give I unto thee. And they didn't even pray. They just reached down and yanked the man up and saw this man healed in Acts chapter three. I used Matthew chapter 10 where the Lord told us to go heal the sick and cleanse the leper. God has already done his part and he has committed his authority unto us. And then I showed from scripture that Satan got his power and authority from man. It is not angelic power. We are the ones that empowered the devil. So he is using the authority that God gave people to rule and to reign. And he cannot do anything to us without our consent and cooperation. So we've got to learn our authority, quit cooperating with the devil. And I spent a lot of time showing how that sometimes we do that even unknowingly, unwittingly. But nonetheless, we have to agree with the devil to give him the power to come in and destroy our lives. The only exception I would make to that is that we live in a fallen world and sometimes you are going to be attacked not because of anything you've done, just other people. Like you could be driving down the road and Satan could have somebody else who's drunk or high on dope come across the line and hit you and that has nothing to do with you. Now I believe that if we were perfect, which none of us are yet except in our spirit, if you were perfect and you were standing and confessing the word and doing everything, I believe that God could even protect you against that because it says no plague will come nigh your dwelling, etc. So if we were working perfectly in everything, I believe that even what Satan is trying to do through other people wouldn't have any effect on us. But since none of us are perfect, we live in a fallen world and sometimes we just get bushwhacked by the devil and sometimes things happen to us that you didn't cause. But I would say the vast, vast, vast majority of everything, Satan has to have cooperation on your part in order to be able to do anything to you. And so we've been talking about that. And then I talked about how that one of the most important things is you've got to start speaking to your problem instead of speaking to God about your problem. Mark chapter 11, verse 23, you have to say to the mountain. And so we talked about that. that implies that you understand you've got authority. You don't have to say, oh God, I have nothing. Would you please do something? No, God gave us his authority, and we have it, and you have to speak to the mountain, not speak to God about your mountain, but speak to your mountain about God. And I emphasized how important it is to say and believe what you say. Most people, our hearts have been trained to disbelieve what we say because we don't keep our word. We say things that we don't mean. And it's not only our words, it's other people's words also. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, it says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So this is what I've already dealt with. And real quickly, let me just say that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created them with words, you and I, angelic beings, physical things, plants, animals, everything was created by and is controlled by words. Words are important. And when God says something, it's a contract. He doesn't say anything that he doesn't mean. It says in Hebrews chapter six, it's impossible for God to lie. God can't say one thing and then do something else. He upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1, 3. And if he was to violate his word, everything would self-destruct. So God says something, it becomes binding. And when he told Adam and Eve, he says, you have dominion. You rule this world. You subdue it. In that instant, God ceased to be in control. And I know that that really upsets a lot of people because they take great comfort in saying God's in control. And yet I've had some of the same people who get mad at me come up and say, that's of the devil. How dare you say that? That's of the devil what you said. I've turned their own logic around on them and say, hey, I couldn't have said it if God wasn't in control. God must want me to say it. 
And so, no, God doesn't control every. Let me ask you this. Does God control you? Does he make you do the right things? Have any of you ever gotten mad? Have any of you ever lusted? Have any of you ever sinned? Have any of you ever done anything wrong? Either he does control or he doesn't control. God does not control what goes on. He gave control to us. Now, God is interested and he works through people and he is going to eventually obtain the right results. God is not losing this battle. So I'm not saying that it's out of control, but he doesn't control it directly. He controls it through us. And this is the reason that sin entered the earth is because he gave us a choice. This is the reason that death came as a result of sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. This is the reason that sickness and disease and wars and things happen, not because God is up there sovereignly controlling it and moving us like chess pieces, and making things happen. He gave us control and we have let the devil do the things that he did. You know, yesterday more, I'm not going to go back there because I've already got enough flack for what I said, but the political things that are happening in our nation today, the immorality that's happening in our nation today, God is not the one who's letting this happen. It's the body of Christ who is letting it happen. And if we would stand up and use our authority, we could stop all of this ungodliness and we could put this nation back on a path. And that's what I'm believing. But it's not going to happen by us just praying and asking God to do it. He gave us authority. We've got to stand up and we've got to use our authority and do something about it. And praise God, I'm doing that. And I believe we're seeing a change come. So I say all of this to say that when I was a little kid, I remember at five and six years old asking the question about why did God wait 4,000 years to send Jesus to the earth? If he loved people, why did he wait 4,000 years? And a second question was, why did Jesus have to come to this earth and suffer? God was God. Couldn't he have done whatever he wanted to? And the answer to all of that is no. He can't do what he wants to. He has bound himself by his word. And in a sense, he tied his own hands when he says, I give you dominion. You rule. You control. He gave dominion to physical human beings. And God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says God is a spirit. The moment he gave us authority, he limited his authority. And again, this, I'm going places that some of you have never gone in your mind. We just assume God could do whatever he wants to. Well, in a sense he could, but he is doing what he wants to and he will not lie. He will not violate his word. He will not take back what he has given us. And so this put God in a position where God could not just create the second Adam the way he created the first Adam. Because when he created the first Adam, there was no opposition. There was nobody resisting him and he hadn't delegated control yet to physical human beings. So he was in absolute control and he just spoke Adam into existence. But when it came to making the body for the second Adam, which is what 1 Corinthians 15 calls the body of Jesus, the second Adam, he had to flow through people. How did he create the first Adam? He didn't reach down with his hands and form the body. He spoke him into existence. And he had to speak the second Adam into existence, but he was no longer in direct control. He could only do it through people. This answers the question, why did it take 4,000 years for Jesus to show up after the fall of Adam and Eve? And the answer is because he had to speak through people. And there was just precious few people that were in communication with him and would allow him to flow through them. For instance, Isaiah had to say, behold, a virgin shall conceive. It had to be a virgin birth and it had to be spoken. Everything that God did in creation, he spoke it into existence. And so he had to speak that it was going to be a virgin birth. Can you imagine how many hundreds, maybe thousands of people that God tried to inspire to say a virgin is going to have a child? 
Can you imagine how many people thought, man, that must be the devil. That can't be God. They weren't about to prophesy that. And then Isaiah comes along and says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. It had to be spoken that he would be born in Bethlehem. It had to be spoken about him. All of these things, that he would be rejected and despised of men, that he would be lifted up and he would draw man unto him. You know, there's over 300 and I forget, 320, 350 prophecies just about Jesus in the Old Testament that spoke the time that he would come, everything. And it took God 4,000 years to get everything spoken that needed to be spoken to form the body of Jesus. That's why it took so long. And the reason that Jesus had to become a man is because God had given authority to physical human beings and God didn't have a body. So Jesus had to become a man. Have you found Luke chapter one yet? <laughs> Put your finger there and look over here in John chapter five and I'll verify this by something that Jesus said. In John chapter five, Jesus was speaking and he was being criticized once again saying, who gave you authority and power to do all of this? And Jesus said this in John chapter five, verse 25. Verily, verily, I, uh, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself and hath given him authority. That's what I've been talking about. Has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. The term son of God always refers to the divinity side of Jesus. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. He was God and man. So when it says son of God, that refers to his divinity. When it says son of man, that refers to his humanity side. And he says here, the reason he had authority was because of this physical body, because he was the son of man. Boy, this is important that you understand this. God had to become a man to defeat the devil because he had given control over this earth to physical human beings. Physical human beings had willfully submitted that authority to the devil and the devil literally had authority to rule this earth because we gave it to him. God didn't give it to him. God didn't put Lucifer down or Satan down here to destroy people's lives. God put Lucifer down here to be a servant to us. Hebrews chapter one, verse 14 says, all of the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. Lucifer only had power to minister to us, not against us. But when he deceived us and then we submitted unto him, we empowered him and he now had legal rights to dominate and control men. Man, there's so much I'd like to say right here, but I just hadn't got time to say it. But this is why God started making covenants. Covenants gave him rights. If you would do this, then it empowered him to do that. And under the old covenant, well, all of the stuff was based on our cooperation and on our compliance because God didn't really have rights to come and just bless us. This is what's behind the whole book of Job. And so anyway, I hadn't got time to go into that, but in the new covenant, it's a different situation because God became a man and Jesus now had rights to deal with the devil because he had flesh. And he went in and he literally entered into the pits of hell and he stripped Satan of whatever power he had. And he, he turned and as he was leaving this earth, he says, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. And he gave it back to us. But this time it's different than the authority that Adam had because now it wasn't a single authority invested in us. It's a joint airship with Jesus. It's like when you sign a check, you know, if you have a joint checking account, both parties have to sign. Adam signed our authority over to the devil. But when Jesus went and got it back, 
Now it's a joint heirship. And even though you may submit to the devil, that might cost you personally. You have given place to the devil, but you'll never have Jesus sign and agree with you. So that power is never going to pass unto the devil again. You have to agree with him, but he'll never agree with you. And so Jesus became a man. That's why he had to become a man. And look at this in Luke chapter one. I'm back in Luke chapter one. If you haven't found Luke chapter one by now, you might as well look on with your neighbor. You aren't going to get there. But in Luke chapter one and in verse 26, and in the sixth month, this is talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. If you read the previous verses. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women." You know this phrase that is translated highly favored? It's a Greek word that is only used one other time in the New Testament. Guess where that is? There you go, Ephesians 1, 6. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 6 says you have been accepted in the beloved. The exact same thing that the angel said to Mary. Mary, you are highly favored. Did you know God said that to every one of you? You are now accepted. You are highly favored in the beloved. You have been blessed and singled out by God just as much as the Virgin Mary was. Man, that is awesome. And look at this. It says... And when she saw him, she was um, troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. You know, if I had come in and said, y'all are a bunch of scumbags. God is mad at you. God's angry. God, you know, most of you say, man, that's God. <laughs> You'd say, oh, that's God, because that's what we've been conditioned for. But when I come in and say, you've been highly favored. You are accepted in the beloved. Some of you are thinking, what strange salutation is this? What <laughs> you know what? We have been accustomed to, to feel and expect God's wrath, but we have been blessed. She was troubled at his saying because she had some religion in her too. Wondering what is this all about? And Gabriel went on to say in verse uh, 30, and the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Man, this is awesome what Gabriel is saying unto her. And then Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? You know, that was a great question. If Adam, I mean, uh, not Adam, but Abraham, if Abraham would have said, God, how am I going to have this promised seed? Is it going to be through Hagar? If he had asked a question like that, it might have solved the whole Arab-Israeli conflict that we have today. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to ask questions. You just need to make sure it's a question of clarification, not a question of unbelief. Zacharias, when he was told that his wife Elizabeth would have a child, he laughed and says, how can this be? Well, that wasn't a godly question. It was an ungodly question. And because of it, God smote him uh, dumb so that he couldn't talk. Exactly what Dwayne and I have been talking about today, that God shut his mouth so that he wouldn't release all of this unbelief and stop this miracle from happening. So his question was a question of unbelief, but Mary, her question wasn't a question of unbelief. It was like, I believe, how, how is it gonna happen? Praise God she asked this question so that she didn't think that she had to rush through with the marriage and go ahead and have a relationship with Joseph. 
And so in verse 35, it says, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Again, Son of God is referring to the divinity. He was going to have a physical body, but it was going to be God manifest in the flesh. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Did you know some of the translations of this verse says, for with God, no word of God is void of power of fulfillment. And then it says in verse 38, and Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You know what this was? Rather than, I actually heard one man, I hate to even repeat this. It's so blasphemous, but I'm going to counter it and put it in its right context. But I heard one man say that, you know, he was speaking against Christianity. And he says, what kind of God would go down and rape a little 13 year old girl and impregnate her? Man, that is terrible. You know what this was? This was the angel. He came and made a proposal. He says, Mary, you're the one that's been chosen. Will you accept this? He didn't force anything upon Mary. Mary had to agree to this and she humbled herself and said, so be it unto me according to thy word. So this was a proposal she submitted to it and received it. And look over here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. The word seed right here came from the Greek word spora, which is where we get the word spore from, like how a flower pollinates itself. It puts out spores. And the word spora is a derivative of the Greek word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. I'm not going to teach a lesson on this. I'm going to hope that everybody understands this already. <laughs> but you came from a sperm. A seed had to be sown. Every one of us is a product of a seed. And did you know that Jesus was the product of a seed? What the angel did, the angel made this proposal. And then when Mary humbled herself and said, so be it unto me, the Holy Spirit came upon her and took all of these 300 plus prophecies that had to be spoken about Jesus and he took all of those prophecies and that was the seed, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And the seed entered into Mary's womb and she conceived. And everything about the virgin birth was 100% natural with one exception. And that is that a man didn't provide the seed. The word of God was the seed. And it took 4,000 years for God to get his seed together because he had to flow through imperfect people. It just shows you how awesome God is that when he was on his own and he wasn't having to flow through people, he could just say, let us make man in our image and boom, here's man. But when he had to flow through us, it took 4,000 years for him to say what had to be said and then he took those seeds and he planted that seed in Mary and she conceived and everything else about the virgin birth was completely natural. This goes back to one of the points that Dwayne has said a couple of times during this series and that is that miracles don't just happen. People think they do. They think, well, I wished I had a miracle. They hear somebody testify and so then they go to praying and begging and asking God to do things. Miracles have to be conceived. Just in the same way that if a woman came forward, you know, I had a woman ask me during this thing to pray with her because she's been barren. I think for 11 years they've been married and she's been barren and she wanted me to pray with her that she could have children. And I said, are you married? And she said, well, yes. And I said, I got to ask. I'm not going to be part of you getting pregnant. Amen. If you aren't married. And so, uh, 
you have to ask nowadays because there's a lot of people that just are sleeping around and they aren't doing what God says. But anyway, I, t- I prayed for her and then I said, now look, I believe God's done a miracle. You go cooperate. You got a part to play. I said, you do your part and I believe God has done his part. But there was only one virgin birth. There's not going to be another one. And if there was a If there was a woman that came forward and she was just praying and begging God to have a child, but if she didn't have a physical relationship with a man, I don't care how much she prays. I don't care how many times we lay hands on her. You can lay hands on her until you rub all the hair off the top of her head and she is not going to get pregnant until she's impregnated with the seed. Hopefully everybody here understands this. But when it comes to spiritual things, People aren't doing this. They're just thinking, oh God, I need a miracle to doctor. And what we do, we tell him how bad our situation is, thinking that if we're pitiful enough, and if we tell him that this is really desperate, this person's going to die if you don't do something, we do all these things, but we don't plant the seed. Miracles happen by seeds. You got to plant the seed. Mary did not just conceive. The Holy Spirit took the word and implanted that in her and she got pregnant and she had to give nine months and carry this child until full term. It did not just happen. And I'm telling you that there are many of you who are praying and you are in need of a miracle and I don't doubt that. And God loves you, I don't doubt that. But you are not taking the seed of God's word and planting it in your heart and you're just looking for the stork to bring you a miracle. You're looking for Dwayne and me to lay hands on you and to just give you a miracle. I hate to even bring this up, but I need to explain it. But you know what? You can get a miracle through somebody else, but it was never intended to be the dominant way that you receive. God gave the gift of miracles and the gifts of healings to certain individuals so that you could receive miraculously through them. In a sense, it's like a surrogate birth. In other words, God doesn't just do a miracle without anybody. Somebody's going to have to do the work. Somebody's going to have to get in relationship with God and take the word of God and let it sow in their heart. But the reason God did that is because if the only way for you to receive a miracle is for you to just take the word of God, meditate on it until it releases this power on the inside of you and you conceive and bring forth the miracle. If that was the only way you could receive, well, then a person who comes today who has only got a week to live and they just get born again today and they don't have time to let the word of God work, then they would just be destined to die. So because of that, because God loves you, there are certain people in the body of Christ that have a gift of miracles, the gifts of healings, and they operate in this and they can get you healed with little faith, not zero faith, but little faith on your part. You can, they in a sense can have a surrogate birth for you and you get healed through them. And that does happen. But you know what? That was never intended to be the way that the body of Christ receives. That's just a temporary measure until we all come into the maturity that we're supposed to have. The problem has been that the body of Christ, this is about the only way they know how to receive. They always are running after somebody. They're wanting you to release your anointing, you to touch them. And again, there are people that God uses like that. But you know, I don't have that ministry. I've had, I had some people, I, you know, I'm not able to pray with everybody and I leave before I can pray. And I've had people beg, please pray for me. I came from somewhere and I understand that they're desperate, but there's people that think somehow or another, I have this anointing to just produce miracles. I was interviewed on a radio program last week and the guy, uh, I had taken him behind the scenes and he meant uh, Clay Caldwell, who had been healed of uh, Crohn's disease. They meant Jeremiah, who had been healed of multiple sclerosis. They meant Raquel, I think. I don't know, but they meant a bunch of people. And every person they meant had been healed of something. So when I got on this guy's radio interview, he says, you've got a healing ministry. Tell the people about that. And I said, I don't have a healing ministry. I got a teaching ministry. But I teach people the truth and they believe and they receive. Raquel gave her testimony this morning. 
Raquel believed and she received. Now, sometimes I agree with them and pray and I get more credit than I should, but my anointing is not to heal people. My anointing is to teach people the truth and it's the truth that sets them free. And as they learn this, that's how they get it. I don't have a healing ministry and yet I have seen tens of thousands of people heal because I teach you how God wants you to receive. So I don't have one of these ministries. I've talked to Benny Hinn and Benny Hinn has one of those. I'm not against that. We need people like Benny Hinn. We need these supernatural gifts, but I'm telling you, you can't count on Benny Hinn being there when the doctor tells you you're going to die. Matter of fact, Benny Hinn has actually had people call into his ministry who've been to his meetings and have received prayer and they didn't get healed. And so his ministry tells them to call us <laughs> and says he can teach you how to get healed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So anyway, with that one exception, there are a few people, not near enough, but there are a few people who have these supernatural gifts that you can get healed with very little effort on your part. But man, if that's what you're depending on, if you're waiting on the great man or woman of God to come through town to wave their hand over you, most of you are going to die before that happens. But you know what? What I'm telling you is you can take the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, and you can plant it in your heart, and it will produce a miracle every single time. It's incorruptible. In the natural realm, you have a whole group of seeds. Some of them are just not going to work because we live in a fallen world, and this uh, natural world is corrupted, and not every seed produces. But the Bible says there, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. God's word is incorruptible. There is not a single promise in the word of God that does not have the power to fulfill itself. That's what this angel says. No word of God is without power of fulfillment. Every word has supernatural power in it. So what we need to do is to recognize that God himself was bound by his own word. He couldn't just say, well, I don't like what you did, Adam. Time's out. King's X, do over. We're starting over. No, he was bound by his word and it took him 4,000 years because God would not violate the authority that he gave human beings. If God won't violate it, how do you think you can violate it? God cannot just reach down and heal this person when he gave you authority and he told you death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he told you in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey his servants you are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, when you go out and just submit yourself to the devil, you give the devil freedom in your life. You give him a right to destroy you. You give him a right to make you sick and to make you depressed and discouraged. I couldn't tell you the thousands of people I've talked to who are dealing with depression and they ask, would you please pray that I could just be healed of depression? I could spend an hour on this. I'm just going to say it and let you think what you want to. Depression is not a sickness and a disease. It's caused because you're focused on the wrong thing. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. If you don't have perfect peace, it's because your mind is not stayed on him. Now you can take medicine that will put you into a vegetative state, amen, and make you to where you don't, feel the same degree of pain and stuff like that, but that's just treating the symptoms. It doesn't solve it. The problem with depression, schizophrenia, mental problems is the fact that your mind isn't stayed upon God. And through that, you have yielded yourself to things that cause depression. I actually saw a bumper sticker on a car one time that says, if you aren't depressed, you aren't paying attention. <laughs> and you know what? That is absolutely accurate if you don't factor God into things. If you just look at things in the natural, I mean, life is a terminal experience. 
you know, every one of us, the youngest person in here is on their way to a grave unless the Lord comes back. And if you were to just look at life and all of the hardships and things that happen and you extract God from it and you just look carnally, it says in Romans chapter eight, verse six, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you are carnal mindedness, it produces death. The reason people are discouraged and depressed and things is because they are thinking on the wrong things. You are yielding yourself to thoughts contrary to the word of God. Dwayne was teaching on this real strong that when he was believing for his grandson, he had to stand and he would not entertain any thoughts and he would not speak things out of his mouth. And that's the reason that he saw his grandson raised from the dead. You've got to get to where you don't let all of the doubt and the unbelief and the darkness of this world into you. And yet most people just embrace the world, pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month to pipe all of the sewage of the world into your home so you can watch it and listen to it. And then wonder, why am I depressed? You're thinking on depressing things. Amen. But if you were to keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, you would have nothing but pure, absolute peace. Another verse that verifies that, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through prayer and fasting and intercession. No, through the knowledge of Him. If you don't have grace and peace abounding in your life, you don't have the knowledge of God. So people are praying, oh God, give me peace. And then you sit there and watch people murder each other for entertainment. You watch fighting. You listen to the news, which is just angry and bitter. And you listen to all of the talk shows that are using sarcasm to blast people and then wonder why aren't I having peace? It's because you don't have the knowledge of God. You have to take these words and plant them in your heart. Did you know every person in here, male or female, you have a spiritual womb. And you have to take the seed, the incorruptible seed, and you plant it in your heart through meditating. You know, I'm, I'm going to come back maybe. But let me show you a verse. I was thinking of this as Dwayne was preaching this morning. And in Proverbs chapter 3, let me read this to you. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep thy, my commandments. Notice all of the emphasis on the heart here, not just the head, the intellect. This is talking about your heart. Let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. How do you write the word of God upon the table of your heart? Look at this in Psalms chapter 45 and in verse 1. It says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made uh, touching the king my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. How do you write stuff on your heart? With your tongue. Your tongue is like a pen. And when you speak things, you are writing it on your heart. And sad thing is most of us are writing on our heart fear, unbelief, worry, doubt, all these kind of things. But we can take the word of God, that incorruptible seed, and go to speaking this word. And when you do it releases this truth into your heart and you conceive a miracle. And just the same as a woman, when she conceives, did you know she doesn't even know she's pregnant at first? It takes a while for the woman to recognize she's pregnant. But then she will recognize she's pregnant before anybody else does. It may not be showing, but then after a while, she begins to start growing. And finally, people start coming up and saying, man, when are you gonna have that baby? Everybody knows you're pregnant. And then you give birth and people say, how long did it take for you to give birth? And somebody says, three hours. Nope, nine months and three hours. 
It's the same. Sometimes people hear you talk about Dwayne and Sue were talking about 20 or 21 days for the miracle of seeing their grandson completely, totally restored. But did you know, really, that wasn't 21 days. That was 30 years of the word being sown in their heart. And man, they were impregnated with the word of God. And when they got into a problem, man, the word was working in their life. And there's so many people that they just wait until the doctor tells them they're going to die. And then they start cramming, trying to get healed. You know what? You can cram for a test, but you can't cram for a harvest. You can't cram for a baby. You can't be just too busy to have physical relationships with a guy, but then you want a child by next week. And so you just go out and try and get it all done in one week. Doesn't work that way. It takes time. And there are some of you that you've waited too long. And you know what? You, you're going to have to run next door to your neighbor and weather the storm in their house and live off of their faith and get them to help you. But the best way is for you to recognize that even God himself, when he wanted to come into this earth and redeem mankind, it took him four thousand years because of his own integrity, because he had delegated authority and he would not just take it back and violate it. You may be in a crisis and you may say, I don't have a year. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact of God that, you know, it takes time for miracles to be conceived. You're going to have to go and get somebody to wave their hand over you and get them to help you because you haven't been planning the word of God in your heart. Now, it doesn't have to take you as long as it takes me to get something. You can be better. That's the reason we have the Bible school. We're teaching you all the things that we've learned. And you can learn by our mistakes and you can shorten a period of time, but it's still a process. You might be able to get it quicker than I did, but it's still a process. And I'm telling you, if you understood what we're talking about, all of this is concerning authority. If you understood this, then instead of you just in desperation crying out, and if you don't see something like that, then you get, well, God, why didn't you do something? You can understand that God has bound himself by his word. He gave you authority. He told you to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And yet you aren't resisting the devil. You are welcoming him into your home. You're meditating on what he wants you to think on. You're thinking his thoughts. You're speaking his thoughts, but then you're praying for God's results. And if it doesn't work, you get mad at God as if God failed. God didn't fail. If God himself is bound by his own integrity and he won't violate his word, well, then you can't just violate it. It doesn't matter how desperate your situation is. Amen. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> see, this isn't acceptable to most people because most people, I, I don't want to see God. I don't want to. I don't want to be a fanatic. That's the reason I came here is for you to pray for me so I could go back to being carnal and go back to being angry and bitter. And, you know, Dwayne talked this morning about a Mark chapter 11, verse 24, somewhere around in there, where if you have unforgiveness in your heart, it stops the things of God. You don't want to get rid of unforgiveness. You don't want to be kind to people. You don't want to study the word. You don't want to spend time doing this. You don't want to pray in tongues, but you want us to do it. And you want us to carry your miracle for you and then deliver it for you. You want us to have your baby. <laughs> and you know what? I'll help all of you I can, but I cannot help everybody. I am, it's not my ministry. I'm not called to that. My ministry is to share with you these truths so that you can take the word of God and you can see it work. I can't go home with you, but I can send the word home with you. I can send the teaching and the truths that God has given me home with you. And if you would take these words and if you would meditate on them, it'll work. You know, when a woman first gets pregnant, it's usually not the first time they have a sexual relationship. We don't understand everything. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you just keep at it. And if something's not wrong with you, you will get pregnant. 
Likewise, I can't say that every time you open the Bible that a miracle is going to be conceived. I believe it's probably because of our own deadness and things like this. But whatever, if you just keep your nose in the book, I can guarantee you this will eventually take root on the inside of you. It will germinate on the inside of you. You will conceive a miracle. And if you don't abort it along the way, it will just automatically bring forth. You know, when you plant an apple seed, that seed doesn't groan and cry. It doesn't fast. It doesn't do all this day. It just, it's just the nature of that seed to start bringing forth. And you see an apple and the tree doesn't go, you know, scream and go, oh, here's an apple. <laughs> no, it's just that nature. It just produces it. It ought to be natural for you to just walk in the supernatural. It ought to get to where it's, you're just supernaturally natural. It's just your nature. This is what Jesus said. You're, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. You got world overcoming faith. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. My sheep hear my voice. They do hear my voice. They will not hear the voice of a stranger. That would all be natural if we were meditating in the word and letting the word just release its life into us. And I love you. Again, I thank you for coming out on a Saturday. I'm not trying to scold you, but I'm saying, brothers and sisters, there's people right here who desire all of the benefits of the gospel. But you aren't taking the seed and impregnating yourself with it. That's just like a woman who desires to have a child, but you aren't going to have a physical relationship. And you just can't understand why it's not working. We would call a woman like that a fool because that's not how it works. And you know what? It's foolish for us to sit here and wonder, God, why aren't things working for me? And you don't know the word. I've had people come up to me and, and uh, in the prayer line and I say, what scripture are you standing on for your healing? And they'll say, well, you know, I don't know where it is. I'm not sure if it's in the old covenant or in the new covenant, but somewhere doesn't it say something like uh, by his stripes, we are healed or were healed. That's like a woman standing next to a man and say, is this close enough? <laughs> if I drink this water, uh, you're pregnant. And if I drink the same glass that you drank from, is that good enough? No, you got to have a little more interaction than that. The Word of God has to, you know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, I, I don't know why, but healing is just something that I latched on to because to me, it was a way to manifest that this is real. And I started believing God for healing. And right after Jamie and I got married, we lived in a little place in Seagullville, Texas, and I had something like the flu come on me and I hurt so bad, I couldn't even stand up straight. I couldn't, I just hurt. And it was time to go to bed, but I wasn't going to go to bed and act sick. I talked about this, this this morning or last night or sometime, that you've got to use your body like a weapon and act like you're healed. And so I wasn't going to go to bed and just lay in bed, but I was too sick to stand up straight. So I got on the floor on my hands and knees so that I wouldn't fall asleep. And I put the Bible in front of me and I started reading Isaiah 53, 4, 1 Peter 2, 24, Matthew 8, 17, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. I started reading these and going over and over. And for eight hours on that hardwood floor, I crawled around on my hands and knees, pushing the Bible with my nose and kept moving so that I wouldn't fall asleep. Quoting, by his stripes, I was healed. If I was healed, I am healed. He himself bore on my infirmities and carried my sicknesses. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. If you do that for eight hours in one night, you'll never have to say, now, where was that scripture? Some of it, well, I just don't have a memory for, for scripture. I, I just don't have that photographic memory like you do. Ask my wife about my photographic memory. <laughs> it is supernatural what I can forget. <laughs> and some of you who say that you just, you just have a photographic me memory. Do you know what? You can tell me 
all about the Super Bowl. You can tell me all about the World Series. You can tell me about people in 1950-something, what their batting average was. You know all of this stuff, but you can't remember where Scripture is found. It's not because there's anything wrong with your mind. It's because you aren't focused on it because you haven't had enough intercourse with the Word. It's not real enough to you. When the Word of God comes alive in your heart, you can find it. I can't always tell you the exact verse, but I can find it in a heartbeat because, man, it's become a part of me. Amen or oh me. I'm saying these things in love, brothers and sisters. Some of you may doubt that, but I am saying it in love because I'm telling you the truth. It's the truth that sets you free. And in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir. This is Saturday afternoon. And yet you're here listening to a hick from Texas talk. You're at least a semi-fanatic. But it just takes more. But it takes more than just coming to a meeting and sitting there for an hour and listening. You've got to take this word and plant it in your heart. And in the same way that Mary said, so be it unto me, according to thy word, she humbled herself and the Holy Spirit took the word and impregnated her. And that's the reason that John chapter one says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It is appropriate for Jesus to be called the word because he was spoken into existence over a period of 4,000 years and then those words were taken and the word literally became flesh and dwelt among us. If God had to go through that effort to see his plan come to pass, well then I just would like to recommend to you that you're also gonna have to go through the same process. Doesn't have to take 4,000 years, but there is a process and you need to take the word of God and implant it in your heart until you conceive and give birth to that miracle. You have that authority. And you write these things on your heart with your words. You need to take these words. You need to get the uh, teaching from here and listen to it over and over and counter all of this negative stuff and then get to where you are speaking it, where you're quoting these scriptures. 